Beyond the psychological and emotional reasons to support Israel, Israel no longer provides the United States a strategic value. Instead, it has become a strategic burden, said Colonel Larry Wilkerson, senior aide to former Secretary of State Colin Powell. So what is it that has influenced Washington to think Israel still may be a strategic ally? We interviewed Professor Stephen Walt and John Mearsheimer, authors of The Israeli Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy, about how the lobby influences Washington. We think of the lobby as a sort of loose coalition, uh, not a single organization. There's no leadership that, that is sort of directing orders of this mass movement or anything like that. Um, but one of the ways in which APAC gains its influence is by its capacity to influence campaign contributions. APAC and the Conference of Presidents and all sorts of other organizations pay careful attention to what the president and his lieutenants are doing at any particular point in time. So they care greatly about the policy machine, policy making machinery in Washington and influencing that. There are also a whole series of pro-Israel political action committees um, and what APAC can do, of course, is in effect certify which candidates ought to be getting support and which candidates ought to be opposed and guide the money, uh, guide the money there. Most organizations or most interest groups only have one PAC, you see, and whereas the lobby has like 30. So each of these little PACs can give, or each of these smaller PACs, I should say, can give the same amount that the Teamsters can give. So it adds up, you know, the Teamsters have a thing called the Teamsters PAC, Political Action Committee, and then you have 20, and so when you add up, when you see these lists of who the most powerful PACs are, you rarely see the pro-Israel ones because each of them isn't in the top 10, but when you add them all up, they're right up there. So the money's important. Of course, once you've been successful in a handful of cases of, you know, either getting someone into office uh, against the odds or driving someone out of office against the odds, everybody notices this. And if you're a congressman or a senator, you have to ask yourself the question, you know, do I want to do I want to run the risk that they'll they'll go after me? The second strategy is to basically work to control the discourse on Israel and on the U.S. Israeli relationship so that Israel is almost always portrayed in a positive light and so that there's no serious questioning of U.S. support for Israel. have the Middle East sort of falling apart in all sorts of different ways, uh, here's an issue where you'd think congressmen would be all over the map, right? Some of them being very supportive, perfectly reasonable, some of them being very critical. It's the way they are on every other issue I can think of, right? What do we do about, you know, Patriot Act, you know, for and against? What do we do about prayer in schools, for and against? What do we do about tax laws, for and against? Abortion rights, for and against? But on this issue, only one side ever gets heard, and that's because politicians aren't, contrary to opinion, stupid. Um, and they figure out what's in their political interests, and criticizing Israeli policy, criticizing American support for Israel is just not politically smart for most congressmen. 5,000 activists are attending the American Israel Public Affairs Committee gathering in Washington. Days, the Senate, dozens of House members, and various top members of the Bush administration took part in the meeting of the American Israel Public Affairs Welcome Committee. to Washington for this extraordinary APAC conference. Look at you. As one senator uh, said anonymously, a few years back, so the point is that when you go up against APAC, they come after you, but if uh, nobody thanks you, for doing it. You earn their opposition, but you don't immediately earn somebody else's gratitude, in, in a sense, and, and additional support. It's a kind of one-sided or stacked deck. So for most congressmen, the smart thing to do is just go along with what the Israel lobby wants you to do and not make waves. You won't lose any support for doing that, and you'll avoid their opposition. That's, I think, the main reason you get these incredibly lopsided votes in the House and Senate whenever there's a, 
resolution that APAC sponsors. The way that the lobby attempts to influence the discourse is by leaning on the media, uh, uh, having large-scale presence in think tanks inside and outside of Washington, and trying to influence what happens in the academic world. So it's that two-pronged approach that they employ and that they employ so successfully that accounts for the fact that we give Israel unyielding support at every turn. Over 1,200 students attended the 2007 APAC Annual Policy Conference. Among them were over 160 student government association presidents. The policy conference included over 500 lobbying appointments with members of the House and Senate, and guest speakers such as Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, Vice President Dick Cheney, former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and Senator Joseph Lieberman. The conference paid special attention to the student activists, specifically to those considered allies to the pro-Israel camp. Outside the conference, we talked to Sarah Lawrence's student government president about his impressions of this APAC conference. I was just sent an email that basically said, uh, as a student government president, you probably have political ambitions and you might want to you know, meet your senator or your representative and lobby them. And so, of course, I was like, you know, that sounds good. But I already knew about APEC, so I knew it was about that. I think in terms of the student government people, most of them just said, free ride to D.C., let's go and drink at night, you know. But when we were in the question and answer, oh, yeah, plane, plane ticket, hotel, everything. And, yeah, that's what amazed me. They have this thing where they play video clips in between, just like um, one of them was all the presidents who supported Israel in their statements. Like, So of course when Jimmy Carter comes up and they show a statement, everyone boos. I was really surprised that the whole crowd in general seemed more conservative, like when Reagan's quote came up and he, like everyone was cheering like crazy. And so then I'm getting the impression that this is actually not so much in line with, you know, the Democrat or left or any liberal kind of, yeah, or the American Jewish public, or even the Israeli Jewish public. 